What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Thursday, July 25th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat stand-up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, global coal demand to stay steady through 2025, according to the IEA. Interesting story. Next up, U.S. Democrats launch bid to hold oil firms accountable for any work they do with OPEC. Super interesting. I got a lot of thoughts here. We'll then jump over to the oil and gas finance side, cover what happened with oil prices, and get a look at Matador's earnings, which actually all markets were down today. Matador was up, though, off some, some really good results. So we'll cover all of that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner rocking a solo show today. Stu's got the night off. So let's go ahead and kick this off. Global coal demand to stay steady through 2025. The most interesting part about this entire article is that it's part of a study from the IEA. So you know they wanted to do everything they can to make sure that coal demand didn't come out the way it did. But hey, at least they're being honest here. Global, I'm reading straight from the article now, global coal demand is expected to remain stable in 2024 and 2025 as rising electricity needs in major economies balance out efforts of increased renewable energy and recovering hydropower. IR guy of the week right there. Got to get in some renewable stuff there. That's according to the IEA, which is basically calling out the electrical consumption both in China and India that continues to drive coal use. Some of the Numbers in 2023, global coal consumption rose by about 2.6 percentage points to a record high again off that strong demand from China and India. Something super interesting is China is now accounting for over half of the world's coal consumed and is their coal demand in 2024 is expected to stay high due to a forecasted 6.5 percent increase in total electric demand despite a recovery in all three of the key renewable energy categories, which is hydro, solar and wind energy we also go ahead and they look at india a little bit and sort of say that early 2024 had a bunch of extreme weather events which caused them to use a lot more coal we actually did see coal demand and coal use drop in europe as they you know continue to roll off fossil fuels and attempt to roll in renewables they had a decline of over 25 percent in 2023 they're expecting the same amount in the end of 2024 Uh, japan and south korea also who have been migrating off coal did see their coal reliance slip a little bit, but at a smaller pace. One of the, this is a hilarious quote. I'm going to butcher this name. Kasuki Samadori, IEA Director of Energy Markets and, and Security. This is an actual quote from him. The continued rapid deployment of solar and wind combined with the, the recovery of hydropower in China is putting significant pressure on coal use. What? You just told me there was record coal demand. Listen to the next sentence. But the electricity sector is the main driver of coal demand, and electricity consumption is growing very strong, very strongly in several major economies. Without such rapid growth in electricity demand, we could be we would be seeing a decline in global coal use this year as structural trends at work mean that global coal demand is set to reach a turning point and start declining soon. Wait a second. So what you're telling me is that the more electricity we consume, the more coal we use isn't that opposite of what everybody's told us wait in order to meet growing energy demands aka electricity demands because i love how it's that sleight of hand they're talking about electricity demand you know wouldn't want third world economies getting access to electricity so we can't give them coal i mean it's hilarious we all current first world economies use coal to get them to the point where they are at now and now they're telling other people who are trying to make the same job no 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 you can't use that but what they're telling you is that as electricity demand rises so will coal demand so this whole you know scheme they're trying to throw us that renewables are working well it's really not because if you're turning on renewables you're actually lowering your electricity demand it's absolutely insane the word salad that they're throwing at they can't even come out and say yeah as we use more electricity we're going to need more coal we're going to need more fossil fuels no 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 it's it's you know it's it's absolutely unbelievable i find it hilarious that you know it's i mean listen to that quote again without such rapid growth in electricity demand well isn't that isn't that good isn't that demand isn't that means that economies are moving is that means more people are getting access to electricity the economies are doing better i mean 
energy demand is 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 a key indicator for a rising economy. Well, no, that's not good. We would not want people to start using more energy. You know, we need to get them using less energy and get them on wind and solar. I mean, it's hilarious. It's basically what they're saying in here. We need you to use less energy and get on wind and solar. Unbelievable. Again, Stu was right about this. The more, the greener we try to go, the more fossil fuels we use. IEA is even telling us coal demand is up. Let's move over U.S. Democrats to launch bill holding oil and gas firms accountable for any work with OPEC. This is super interesting here. I'm going to read straight from the article. Democratic U.S. lawmakers on Wednesday introduced a bill to hold energy companies accountable if they are found by federal regulators to have colluded with the, with OPEC to raise oil prices. The bill, which was introduced by Senator Ed Malarkey and Representative Nanette Bargain, again, sorry if I butcher the name, says if any energy company is found by the FTC to have colluded with OPEC, it would no longer be eligible for new oil and gas leases on federal lands and water. There's a quote in here that Malarkey, he said in a statement that this bill is the first step towards ensuring big oil gets big consequences when they profiteer off the back of hard working Americans. Of course, there's some other co-sponsors, including our favorite Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Raul, and, and, and Raul Grava. This comes off the heels of the U.S. Senate Budget Committee launching a probe last month into basically all domestic oil producers to see if they've been colluding with OPEC. The American Petroleum Institute came out and said this was a, quote, election year stunt, which is probably true. It's also important to note that this is not really going to pass. We've got U.S. House. The U.S. House of Representatives is controlled by the Republicans, so it's very unlikely that this would pass the House if it did ever make it to the president's desk. He would most likely sign it, so obviously that's it. This all, again, all comes off the heels of the FTC accusing Scott Sheffield, who at the time was the CEO of Pioneer Natural Resources, of colluding with OPEC in order to artificially inflate oil prices. They went ahead and let that merger go through, but barred him from being on Exxon's board, which is app, which is pretty unbelievable. You know, Exxon ended up submitting about 1.1 million documents and other information as part of that probe to the FTC. And they said that they raised no concern with his business practices. So, I mean, again, it's all just a political stunt. What I find interesting here is again, this is all just hand waving. This is to say, hey, we're standing up to big oil. You know, if you look at the cover image, of course, you got Elizabeth Warren standing behind. Again, there's there's very little substance to this in terms of the the FTC doesn't necessarily have the same rule book. There's no defining what collusion is is a little bit subjective. And that's part of what the FTC is. The FTC doesn't have a rule book to say what's collusion and what's not. It's a little bit like, well, there's a, you know, it, it looks like collusion. They're texting. And what does texting mean? I, you know, we, we all text a lot of people. If I was liable for everything I ever said in a text, holy smokes, we'd all be done. So the fact that, you know, they got Scott Sheffield for app for texting somebody or, or, communicating with people in OPEC. It's like, well, duh, he's in the oil and gas business. And, you know, the, the funny part is, I think what they don't understand is that OPEC doesn't care about U.S. shale. And they don't actually like it. Remember back in 2014 when they turned on the taps and tanked U.S. shale? I mean, it's the same OPEC. They haven't changed. They, there's no incentive for them to work with the United States. It's two different glo it's two different over it's two different markets, really. I mean, you've got Brent and WTI. Yes, there's some, there's definitely a correlation there, but I, I think the part that these the these these you know this this US Congress people are missing is the fact that they think OPEC will do what US shale wants. No, no they won't. Trust me. They may say it up front in order to you know, for whatever reason, but they're going to do what's in their best interest. And they're already holding back production. So what do you, what, what's more to do? Hey, we need you to, you know, hold back more oil production. I mean, no, that's, that's definitely not. I mean, again, I think what's also all getting lost in, in the tap here is that if President Trump, former President Trump wins, which is looking highly likely that he will, that's going to do more, in my opinion, damage, quote unquote, to the to oil price than any quote unquote collusion that's going to happen. So what's funny is if Ed Malarkey wants oil prices to go down, probably should elect Trump. But you can't tell him that because that's, you know, threat to democracy, all that. We're just going to get mad if someone gets caught emailing anybody associated with OPEC. 
pretty unbelievable. Let's go and cover oil prices today and look at EIA crude oil inventories. But before we do that, guys, we got to pay the bills. As always, thank you for checking out us at www.energynewsbeat.com. All the, quote, news and analysis that you hear is brought to you by that website. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. You can hit the description below for all the links, timestamps, and all other things things surrounding you can hit us up on Substack where you can actually see these articles early and you know we we record this in the afternoon drop it in the morning so if you sign up for a Substack you can actually see all of these articles a lot lot quicker again check us out www.energynewsbeat.com you know overall markets today pretty tough day for the markets S&P 500 down 2.3 percentage points Nasdaq down 3.65 percentage points mainly off the back of both Ford and Tesla having pretty horrible earnings reports. Both of them missed their expected guidance. And so specifically on Tesla's end, that's going to drive both the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 down. Uh, we saw two and 10-year yields fairly flat. Dollar index down about a tenth of a percentage point. Bitcoin down about six tenths of a percentage point, 65,000. Crude oil basically flat, actually closed up, currently down as we record this year, about 5.15 in the afternoon. Uh, 77.49, but it actually closed a little bit above 79.90, which was was, you know, basically a couple percentage points higher than it was during the open. We did see Brent oil 81.76. That did close a little bit higher. Natural gas, $2.12. That's up about three tenths of a percentage point relative to the close. You know, oil prices, at the, you know, we, we saw them trading down, you know, in, in the low 77s yesterday. Things opened up and overnight rolled over a little bit. EIA crude oil inventories did drop. You know, we saw some interesting stuff here. About a 3.7 million barrel draw from the strategic or from the crude oil inventories. Analysts expected about a 1.6 million barrel draw. So a little bit, a little bit more than what was expected. We did see gasoline stocks drop by about 5.6 million barrels. We can go ahead and throw up that chart if we want. We also did see distillate stockpiles, which include diesel and heating oil, fell by about 2.8 million barrels versus about a 250 barrel increase, according to the IEA. Bob Yeager, he's the director of energy futures over at Mizuno in New York. Demand is better than anticipated. We like that as long as gasoline demand is doing well. That will support the rest of the market in the short term future. Higher distillates demand was also an icing on the cake. You know, it's going to be very interesting what happens this summer. We're expecting as we roll into earnings season here, uh, specifically U.S. oil refiners are going to spar, are going to most likely report lower second quarter earnings versus a year ago versus, you know, mainly due to the fact that driving season was a little bit down and we had multiple week refining margins. That's according to a bunch of analysts, obviously China, things going on there. So I think oil prices are a little bit in a shaky spot, but but nothing bad with with $77. We've got our first earnings report this year. We also did see range resources drop, but I do want to focus on Matador. They go ahead and report a record second quarter results and do a full increase of their 2024 production guidance. Um, so a, a pretty, pretty good, you know, pretty good press release. I mean, you talk overall markets were down, as I said, about 2.3 percentage points in the S&P 500. Your XOP contract, um, let me pull it up here, was down, I think, one. One percentage point. Yeah, it was uh, six tenths of a percentage point. And Matador was up 1.25 percentage points. So Street really, really liked this. Total average daily production, about 160,000 BOE per day, 95,000 barrels of oil. Net cash provided by operating activities, about $600 million, 592 to be exact. Adjusted free cash flow. So, I mean, again, now we're talking non gap numbers, 167 million. Net income, about $228 million. Adjusted net income, $250 fifty-five million dollars or about two dollars and five cents per share. EBITDA came in at about five hundred and seventy-eight million dollars and their midstream asset came in at about fifty-eight million dollars of EBITDA. Spent about three hundred and fourteen million dollars of capital expenditures on their upstream assets and midstream came in at about forty five million. I mean pretty crazy though they they upped their guidance from 153,000 to 159,000 BOE per day to about 158 or 158,000 to 163,000. So that's an increase of about 3.2 percentage points. You know, a lot of their stuff is that Northern Delaware Basin. We're still waiting on their Ameridev asset to close. So all of these numbers are still exclusive of that. I find it really interesting, though. They turned on a record 47 wells within quarter two, which was actually the most they've ever done. 
I want to pull up, pull up, where is it here? Oh, right here. Okay, so that included 21 gross wells in the Dagger Lake South Wells, and they also saw the Antelope Ridge asset, which was part of the advanced acquisition. They saw, what was it? The, the, the 21. Oh, that was that 21 wells was part of that Antelope Ridge asset. Those wells are exceeding their quote unquote expectations. 24 hour IP rates are about a 1700 BOE per day at about 83% oil cut, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good. Well, there we'll take that, you know, Hey, you know, the Northern Delaware basin as we've seen has really become the new, it has really been, and honestly has been surpassing the Midland basin in terms of, of, of tremendous wells. We're seeing really high IPs, really high oil cuts, a lot of water, but a lot of that infrastructure is fairly built out. Overall oil production was up about three percentage points better than their expectations. So continue, continue to, to do good for Matador. They're, they're, they're you know, con- considering the fact that they, you know, started, you know, they, they, they go on to stout that they were started with $270,000 and all of those family and friends are still shareholders today. So it's pretty crazy. They, they mentioned that in their report. So, you know, Matador's doing some really good work. They talk a lot about their, they're doing a trifrax now doing a bunch of U-turn wells down there. So doing a, really doing a lot of efficiency stuff there. I, I, I highly recommend checking out the entire press release, but the, the, the street really liked what Matador did and, and I'm sure they'll continue to, uh, add that a Meridev acquisition is expected to add about 25,000 BOE per day sometime in the third quarter um, with about 117 million of barrels of oil in reserve and about, you know, they're, they're talking about 370 net locations, which is pretty good. So good for Matador. We'll continue to see a lot of these earnings report pile up. Probably going to be a good earnings season considering there was, you know, basically a consistent $80 oil during quarter two. So we'll probably see a lot of this stuff as we roll through. It'll be interesting to see how this layers in with the overall economy. But that's really all I've got, guys. Appreciate everybody checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast Energy News Beat for Stuart Turley and Michael Tanner. Have a great day. We will be off tomorrow. Stu, we'll have something, one of the conversations in Energy with Stu Turley will run on Friday. You'll hear the weekly recap on Saturday, and then we will be back in the chair on Monday to keep you up to speed, guys. So we appreciate you hanging with us. We'll see you Friday, Saturday, and then we'll be back on Monday.